Erica and Caroline, who've been thinking most of all about teaching, uh, before we switch on to a new topic, you heard what Chris Foreman said. He's not in education, he's not a teacher. Uh, as far as I know, he's a business person and a philanthropist and so forth. But, um, you know, he said the way we're socialized, that I assume he meant educated, uh, this all is kind of difficult. Uh, Erica, you're a re educational reformist. What, <laughs> what can be done? What are some of the things that can be done in educating, in schooling, that would uh, more closely align uh, or make uh, this, this counter-socialization possible? That's a wide open question for you. I know you want to talk about this topic. That, that's a huge question. Um, well, I think that a lot of it has to do with taking risks in the classroom, which is hard for teachers who are constrained by the various common core standards, et cetera. Um, but I, I think that one of the biggest, most exciting things that I see when I'm working with teachers in classrooms is bringing in poets and poems like this as a way to get students excited about language and thinking about using language in ways that they haven't ever thought about using language before. Great answer. Um, Caroline, I'm going to turn that question. What do you think about this education question? So uh, for me with these, with these poets and thinking about this educational question, um, the line that always sticks with me from actually my life is, uh, isn't the avant-garde always pedagogical? Mm. Um, and uh, Alan Golding has an essay with this title. Yes. Um, and I like to take these methods, uh, a lot of these poets use these constraints and use them, and Charles Bernstein uses this in his pedagogy, and kind of use them as ways for students to to read poetry that maybe isn't avant-garde um, or read novels um, and to learn how to, to bend and shape form um, in unexpected ways, ways that they're taught um, and socialized not to touch or um, uh, play with literature. Mm. So I feel like even if they're not having this content or these poets in their classroom, they can be taught to um, uh, use the techniques of these poets to yes. learn about literature. Yeah. Um, so I, I would definitely put a plug in um, to look at um, Bernadette Ma Mayer's writing experience mm -hmm. and also look at the reading experience, W-R-E-A-D-I-N-G. Reading, yes. Reading experiments um, as ways that you can um, read poetry or literature um, and learn about form. W. R-E-A-D-I-N-G, reading. And so reading in that sense, I think this is Bernstein's word, right. reading becomes a combination of reading and also writing. Right. And I also hear in that making, like kind of a kneading. Right. Um, and I think there is a movement in higher education that instead of simply learning things, from, you know, you learn literature, the thing to do is to do more making. Right. So you, you respond, instead of having students like uh, just write uh, blogs, little discussion responses are just kind of basically repeating what I say in lecture, I have them yeah. respond by making something that yes. would deal with the form of what we're talking about, like Melville. Yes. So write in the style of Melville or deform yeah. Melville. Um, yes. Make Melville talk back to Poe and Poe style or something like that. And that right. helps them... Um, learn in a more ra a radical way. And a lot of this doesn't, it doesn't come out of uh, something I've learned in pedagogy. It comes out of what I've learned from these poets. Um, yeah. This is a hot topic. Um, Al, can I jump in for one second? Yes, please. Um, I would also just add to everything Caroline says that Charles Bernstein also has writing experiments, too. Mm -hmm. So he has the reading experiments and the writing experiments, and the writing experiments are kind of like a companion to the Bernadette Mayer. Yeah. And um, he has an essay on exactly this kind of pedagogical thing in his book, Attack of the Difficult Poems. Yes, Attack of the Difficult Poems. Um, 
two comments from me about this, because this is a topic that's dear to my heart. So many people, since we started Modpo in 2012, I have encountered so many people around the world who were turned off by poetry because of the well-intentioned but basically failed way in which it was taught to them. With all the best intentions, all the great poems, and there was a certain delivery mechanism. Here's a great poem, I deliver it unto you, and you will maybe recite it, or you will learn it, and you will learn how to scan it and, and understand the metricality of it. And so many, so many young people then they went in a different direction. And years later, they encounter, uh, for instance, this course or some other reading group, and they realize, oh, I just, it wasn't taught to me in a way that made me feel like I could be a co-creator. Now, that's the first thing I want to say. The other is about classrooms. So many classrooms, and alas, too often my own, um, are so set up to move through the hour or the hour and 20 minutes in a perfectly predictable fashion with the goals stated from the beginning and the outcomes predicted in the curriculum plan made in September, but now it's November. And if you're teaching a poem that goes and wanders and digresses and knows that the efficient way is always the longest way, and you're in a classroom in which you're driving home in a very direct narrative way, there's no way that Hedginian or, or Bernadette Mayer or, you know, or almost any of these poets we've been reading lately has a chance against that A to Z-ness, that narrativity of the classroom. And so it's very hard for teachers to let go and allow the class to wander, particularly if you know, evaluators and, and superintendents are looking in on the classroom and wondering why the hell this thing is digressing. We are really up against it, folks. It's a very difficult thing. 